Hey everyone, this is Aspet Bedrosian. And this is Hovik Manucharyan. And we're talking with Gevis Gadjian on the latest conditions and events during the Artsakh blockade. Gev is with the ANC in Artsakh, nagorno karabakh and he lives in Stepanagert. Today is March 2nd, 2023. This is the 81st day of the Artsakh blockade. Hey Gev, good evening. How are you? Good evening, guys. Gev, good evening. Good evening, good evening. Good to be on. So can you tell us a little bit about how the day-to-day is going in this uh, blockade right now? Yeah, I would say certain things have plateaued a bit. So we've had gas for a little over a week now, which is a good thing. On top of that, some of the effects on a societal basis, you can see schools are back in session. Mm -hmm. Uh, People are driving their cars. Transportation is uh, at an uptick. So that's good. However, We're still dealing with the energy crisis here. Rolling blackouts continue. The food shortages are still in place. So that's still the rationing, the coupons, all that stuff is still in play. In essence, uh, you know, we went from a complete blockade to a complete blockade minus gas. Yes. (laughs) Now plus gas. But yeah. So... The news yesterday was that another meeting took place between Artsakh and Azerbaijani representatives. What is your view of the meeting between the two sides who are reportedly discussing humanitarian and operational issues only? Yeah, so I think there's there's two sides to this. Uh, we're very well aware of the negatives. I think there is something good about Artsakh officials speaking directly to Azerbaijan because Armenia has removed itself in the process. And this way, the people that are supposed to be accountable to the populace are the ones in the negotiating process. Now, that that's a good thing. The, mm-hmm. the bad things are that, and what we're hearing a little bit, is that the Azerbaijani side keeps moving the goalpost, right? Always. So, always. And, and this was the fear that we've always had. When you allow them to dictate statecraft and who comes, who stays, who goes, they're going to want more. And if you give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. So right now we've got to be very diligent. And even if it means that this blockade lasts longer, we have to make sure that we don't concede to some of the absolutely outlandish points that they have, whether it's installing their own checkpoints, which is a no-go. I also think we have to be very diligent in terms of what they want out of the mine. The, you know, having observers is one thing, shutting it down completely when it is your largest taxpayer and it you know employs hundreds if not thousands of people mm-hmm. that's obviously something that should be unacceptable yeah that's right it was a little odd that uh, they closed it down operationally upon demand by the azeris when so many people's livelihood depends on that to be fair i think the argument was that given the blockade they can't even extract the they can't export uh, what mine they yeah, they, or or because of the energy issues they can't you know work some of their like equipment so effectively it is also on their demands but technically we had i think no other choice but yes i i echo uh, gifts concerns in that we should not make it a habit of complying with Azerbaijani sort of ultimatums but you know one thing that i wanted to say and it's uh, based on you know, it's very difficult because a lot of people, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm one of them, consider the regime in Armenia, let's say, not complying with the best interests of Armenia at hand, to say the least. And Alay Karatsunyan has been associated with Nikol Pashinyan and the Armenian regime. So it's very difficult to have trust in the Armenian government. But I did follow some of the people who um, were in that meeting yesterday and the, the day before. And that includes the National Security Council chief, Shahramanian, and uh, Sergei Martirosyan, who has a separate organization outside the government that uh, deals with collaboration and cooperation with the Russian forces. And, you know, Martirosyan, for instance, is his son is still missing from the war. His remains have not been discovered. And he had been part of the group of parents who were allowed to search the battlefields, basically, all the, the months following the war for remains of their children. So it gives me a little bit of confidence that these people will follow the interests of the uh, state of Artsakh more than some others, people who maybe not even don't have a military education, don't have military experience, nor 
the state, you know, don't have the moral uh, qualifications. Uh, and that meeting was also interesting because it was the first time that they shared uh, a photo of the meeting. So it made me wonder why Azerbaijan agreed to participate in that meeting with no Azeri flags, Azerbaijani flags in front of them, in front of their delegates. And of course, Artsakh did not have its own flags. The only flags present were the flags of the Russian Federation. And the meeting happened just as Lavrov was visiting Baku. So this seems to be like a PR concession from Aliyev to Russia. And to me, it seems like another masterful way that Aliyev is exploiting democracy to his benefit. You know, there are some who criticize this meeting, that the, the, the meeting shouldn't happen at all, at all, because it makes the Russians look good. It makes the Azeris look good. We still stuck with the blockade, guys. It's been more than 80 days. And the Azerbaijan, as you said, is still moving the post. So from one perspective, I think that this is an attempt by Russia to appear in control and to basically re a response to the West's efforts to move the negotiations between Armenia and Azerbaijan to uh, Brussels. Um, at least that's my opinion. What, what are you guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I think if I can, and you guys know me, you know, I don't like to opine, opine too much <laughs> on, you know, what's going on because things are always moving. But if I can speculatively say that you're right, I think this is an attempt by you know, Russia to, to show that it still has some stature, some control in, in what happens here. And I don't think that it is a coincidence. The word that you use, timing, is essential. I don't think it is a coincidence that this is happening while Lavrov is in Azerbaijan. And I also think that maybe there's a chance that he wants to leave Azerbaijan, saying that he's come to a conclusion. And yes, while you are right that Russia is trying to regain foothold in this process, none of it means anything if it can't come out with a result. So I think that it is in Russia's best interest right now, whatever these last few days of negotiations are, to come out with the lifting of the blockade. Now, this might be speculative, but I'll say it on the record now. Kev, yesterday, President Arai Karutunian introduced the new state minister, Gurgen Nersesian, who is replacing Rupen Vartanian. He has taken the helm of all Artsakh ministries except foreign affairs and defense. Those roll up directly to President Harutunyan. Have you met Nersesian and what's your impression of him? I've uh, had a few brief interactions with him before his appointment. I will say that in his role as prosecutor, I haven't heard too many complaints. And uh, I will also say that he's an Artsakhti born and bred, served in the military, quite an educated guy, quite young. So I still want to give him the benefit of the doubt, and I still want to give him a chance to, you know, perform at his best capacity. I was pleased in many aspects of what Ruben Vartanian was doing, and I was, you know, sad to see him go. But I also think that everything in his Artsakh is very delicate, and until people give us a very good reason, uh, we have to support uh, the people trying to run the show here to a mm -hmm. certain extent. Gev, the Azeri side has presented these meetings as being about, quote, reintegrating Gharapa Armenians back into Azerbaijan, unquote. There have been multiple official rejections of this view from Artsakh and statements that Artsakh is not discussing its status with Azerbaijan and the current talks are not a replacement for peace negotiations. Can you tell us what the view is from inside, from Stepan Aguerd about these meetings? I can say that those sentiments are genuine to a certain degree. And we've heard this from, from numerous, whether it's publicly or privately, from numerous leaders in Artsakh stating that that is not up for the discussion. If we have mm -hmm. any red lines, that is the reddest line for us here. And I also think a part of it is like they would lose complete support from the people. So there's that caveat. And I've heard a few lawmakers here and, and you know, stakeholders in Artsakh state this that these negotiations or talks are not political in nature, though one can say everything is political. This is about the logistical, how we run the country. So it goes into gas supply, electricity, and some of that stuff. Uh, and they've been very careful and persistent about that specific point to, to say that we're not discussing status. We're not discussing things of a political nature. And in fact, uh, to go a little bit further, R.I. Karutunyan, yesterday said that essentially the only option for Artsakh is independence and Artsakh cannot be part of Azerbaijan and anyone who shares a different opinion, basically I think he said, does not have the right to walk with us. Uh, so 
it seems like I mean the, the, at least verbally. Yeah, they're saying the right things. Things are coming, coming, but 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 unfortunately, you know, what is the action? What is the end result? Some of the things that are rumored to be on the table in terms of concessions, you know, sound unimaginable to me, such as, as Giff said, the checkpoints that Azerbaijan wants to establish. And as soon as a checkpoint is established, it means that, you know, all of Artsakh is going to be essentially, I mean, I don't know, I don't, I don't see how Artsakh would agree to live there in that, under that regime. Well, Gev was saying that uh, checkpoints are a bit of a red line already, but they're already talking about some kind of a middle ground with x-ray machines, no-touch x-ray machines, basically. Well, if it's no-touch, it's, it's still good, but would the government in Azerbaijan have the per- right to get the logs from those machines and the images, you know, those are, I think, yeah. I think mm-hmm. Azerbaijan has to have zero control over monitoring what's even, even if it's civilian goods, it should have zero control over what's going on, who is bringing it and so forth. So that's, I think, the red line too, in my opinion. Look, I, I believe it was a few weeks ago that we talked and I first brought this up, the idea of an x-ray machine. And I think that this is the middle ground that they're working on, and folks expected that after Ruben Vartanian left, it might be a quick process in terms of lifting the blockade. But I think now they're talking about the concrete details of how what that looks like. Look, I'm opposed to any infringement and any insight from Azerbaijan on what happens to people that aren't their citizens, aren't under their jurisdiction. But I think that this is an attempt by maybe the Russian peacekeepers maybe our side to present a solution that uh, can, you know, keep Azerbaijan's thoughts of having their own checkpoints away. But we will see, and I think that's what they're working on these last few days, what that looks like exactly. Physical presence is an absolute no-go. X-rays I've heard many times. So we'll see what that looks like. The other thing we should mention is that there was a shooting by Azerbaijan at civilians in Artsakh doing work on their lands. So there was one in the Martagert region, and today there was one in Askeran. And if you guys want a really morbid take on all of this, those are usually indicators that this process where they're talking, negotiating is actually, some will say hindered, is actually moving forward in a way because this is their playbook. Uh, If they see that they're coming to an impasse somewhere, they'll fire or try to create some instability or whatever. I don't think it'll work, but it it says something about the process that's ongoing right now. All right. We're going to leave it there for today. Thank you, Gev. We'll uh, talk in a couple of days again. Yes. Good to be on, guys. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Gev. 